<laughs> so I can remember as a child, hippies, and there was a lot of talk mm. about LSD and, and, and various psychedelics. But then it seemed to go really fairly quiet. I mean, I was born in 57, so I'm probably talking about the, the 60s. I had this peripheral, peripheral awareness of, of this. Mm -hmm. um, and looking back, well, being reminded from, from your book, um, there was some pretty successful psychedelics being used in, mm -hmm. in psychiatry in, in the mm -hmm. what, what, late 40s, early 50s. Certainly well, a lot in the, in the late 50s. In the late 50s, uh, yes. I mean, it, it, I think it was about 53 that Sando made mm. available LSD um, for research, uh, particularly in psychiatry. And I think in 57, the man, the faint man who, Robert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, he made LSD. Uh, he also, he then got access to magic mushrooms and then worked out that the active ingredient in magic mushrooms was called psilocybin. And Sando made that available. It was called Indocybin. So there were, were basically two medicines. LSD was called Delicid and Psilocybin was called Indocybin. And they made it available to researchers in, in most Western countries, in fact. And it was, and in those days, there weren't any psych psychiatric treatments. The drugs mm. you mentioned earlier, chlorpromazine, wasn't really being rolled out to the, to the late 50s and imipramine and antidepressants later. So, so these drugs were the first true treatments in psychiatry and psych psychiatrists thought they were really very very powerful and effective um, but then uh, they moved out of medicine uh, into what you alluded to sort of became part of the hippie culture and the hippie culture was anti the Vietnam War mm. and the American government was very pro the Vietnam War and when hippies were putting up placards saying drop acid, not bombs, that was seen as a, a terrifying threat to the US establishment. And they couldn't ban protests, uh, but they could ban the drugs. So they banned the drug, they banned LSD. And then you thought, well, there's other drugs like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, we'll ban those. So they, even though there was no <laughs> suggestion that these were about either harmful or even fueling protests. So the drugs got banned by the US in 1968. The we followed suit as we always do when the Americans say jump is in high, high sir. And then in 71 the UN banned them and uh, and they're still banned. <laughs> they've been banned ever since. Yeah. It's impossible to work with them. And I, I I think that's the worst censorship of of clinical re of research and clinical therapy in the history of the world. 55 years drugs which could tra transform people's lives for depression, PTSD, mm. addictions, they've been banned simply because the American government thought they were, fu they were actually fueling a, an anti-war protest. Our generation, isn't it? Um, you yes. know, if yeah. you think of the, the mental distress I've had in times in my life, um, you know, could that have been attenuated, ameliorated, you know, mental distress I've seen in those around me? Very likely, John. I think that that's a very important point to make. That uh, I'll, I'll make it in slightly different ways. Um, mm. But it, it wasn't just that these drugs were the first psychiatric medicines. Uh, they were also powerful mm. and enduring. So, you know, you didn't need many, you know, one or two trips. could give you a very, very long-lasting effect, some, maybe a lifetime. And then, of course, there's the other ways of using them. So Hoffman, Hoffman lived to 102, and he right. used... We, he used what we would call a sort of mini or a microdose of LSD on a regular basis to keep his brain active and functioning. And yeah. the, the, first, the first British psychiatrist to use it, it, LSD was a guy, man called Joel Elkies. He was professor in Birmingham in 1953, and he took LSD, and he wrote about the experience and said, I think I know how it works. And uh, he lived to 103. So, so it, it's quite possible that if we use these drugs sensibly, like the early guys did, they could have given us resilience and, and, and longevity too, as well as help treating mental illness. Yeah. Well, what are the main, I mean, what, what, what is a, how, how do we define the term psychedelic? I mean, has it got a precise meaning or is it? So the term psychedelic, it, it, there was a lot of debate in the, obviously the famous, uh, the writer who made that made psych the term psychedelics um, known, uh, and he helped coin the term. It wasn't his term, though, actually, uh, was obviously Aldous Huxley. And uh, he and a guy called Humphrey Osmond, Humphrey Osmond was a British psychiatrist who couldn't get a job in 
in Britain, or at least couldn't get a job that paid well enough. So he went off to, to I think, Winnipeg, you know, in the middle of the Canadian uh, plains, where they were desperate for British doctors. But he and he started using uh, LSD as a treatment, and he was the person who actually gave LSD to to, to Huxley because Huxley's writings, first writings, actually, yeah. from mescaline, not from LSD, which is a, a cactus derived. Yeah. Okay. And they, t- what, what are we going to call this? And I think Huxley said, "Oh, what about Farith and Enthemome or something?" I don't even know how to say it. I think Osmond said, "No, that's not that, that's not going to catch on." And he said, "What about this work, psychedelics, like it, from the Greek mind manifesting?" And and that's what basically what's a psychedelic? Something that helps you understand your mind better. So the particular compounds we've mentioned psilocybin. That that's from mushrooms. Magic We've mentioned, mentioned mentioned LSD, lysergic acid, yes. that, that's 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 purely chemically synthesized, isn't it? Ah, not originally, no. Oh, right, okay. So Hoffman, here's a tale. Here's a, is it, this is this actually. Many of your listeners might, may not know this. So, nature makes a thing called lysergic acid, right? right. I don't know that, right? yeah, various fungi make lysergic acid. The ancient Greeks knew about it. The ancient Greeks knew that when ergot, the fungus grew on the cereal crops. In fact, the ancient Greeks thought the purpose, the main purpose of cereals was not to make bread, but to eventually in autumn, when, when you had dew, the fungus would grow. And they see these black things growing. Great. That's now... The, the, the rye is matured. They take the ergot, dissolve it in wine, and make a drink called the kikion, which is which is a kind of psychedelic drink. And and they they love that. It fueled many of their um, celebrations, which were called the Eleusinian Mysteries, for about fifteen hundred years. In fact, those they were so popular that the Romans, when they took over Greece, thought the, the you know the high level <laughs> Romans said we like this too. So the Romans allowed them to carry on because the Romans just took part in it. It was part of a festival. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, but, but then in, the, in medieval times, people still knew there was a value, even though they weren't making the drink, there was a value to, to ergot. And it, the, 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 the knowledge of ergot was held by women because they knew that ergot, which contains lysergic acid and other ergots called er- ergotamine, could be used to help women stop bleeding after they've given birth. It constricts the uterus. And we still use it today for that mm-hmm. effect. And, and so these women were using ergot, but people knew that ergot itself or the, could be slightly psychedelic or hallucinogenic. And that's one of the reasons women got persecuted, because they were using these slightly hallucinogenic substances. They were treated as witches and then persecuted. My own view is it was actually a significant desire by the male medics to eliminate competition and to actually, you know, it's part of the usual hostility to women. But, but, we, but ergotamine still exists. And, and what happened, what Hoffman and his, his um, boss, they worked out what ergot was. They yeah. got the chemical structure. Then they worked out how to use it and make molecules. And then what Hoffman was trying to do was make a version of ergotamine or lysergic acid, which you couldn't patent because they were known. He was trying to, make, as most drug companies have done ever since they took willow bark and turned it into, into aspirin, take a natural molecule, make a conversion, patent it, make lots of money. Uh, and intriguingly, I suppose thankfully, he discovered when he took the lysergic acid and put on these couple of um, ethyl groups to an amide link, it was very different to anything he tried before, and and so that's uh, that's how LSD was discovered. Yeah. Interesting. So, it's me- me- so you can make it from natural products, adding those diethylamides, or yeah. I, I don't, actually, I don't know whether they make it purely synthetically. I don't know. Mm. But it's quite. It's copying nature, isn't it? It's copying natural molecules. Yes, that's one of the ways we often describe. This new field of medicine is, 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 is sort of plant-based or natural medicines as opposed to synthetic medicine. Mm. But it just, John, just to be so you have to be clear, modern the regulations make it virtually impossible. We could not study natural mushrooms or natural DMT. You know, we the current regulations make it virtually impossible for us to study those natural products in the UK because everyone's so obsessed with purity rather than value. Well, the regulators are anyway. Yeah, that's interesting. This is the sort of 
dichotomy, as it were, between uh, ph pharmaceuticals and herbalism, isn't it? In pharmacy, you aim for one molecule of a very precise known mm. amount with a very precise defined purity and, and uh, structure, which is, is fine. But in, in herbalism, you've got a wide variety of molecules that might interact, that might inhibit, that might synergize, that yeah. might potentiate. Exactly. Um, we, we, it's harder to control the, the dose. But I, I, I have come across people locally who, who actually have acquired quite a high level of expertise in psychedelic mushrooms um they, they are aware that you can dry it that you can wear it out uh, weigh it out they yeah, they yeah. know they, they know the um the effect a particular dose will have exactly. and it does seem to have a level of predictability um now of course we're, we're not condoning that that's illegal these are class a drugs at the moment but but surely you're, you're one of the well you are the most senior psychopharmacologist in the country a very experienced psychiatrist obviously you can prescribe whatever you like well, obviously, I can. <laughs> the reality. Does, it, or does the nanny state get in the way? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the worst, as I said, the worst example of censorship of yeah. medicine is the censorship of psychedelics. Because not when they were banned, I mean, this was it was cynical and cruel. Yeah. The ban wasn't just to stop people taking it recreationally and protesting the war. They said that they were banned because they were very dangerous. And so they were put into Schedule 1 of the British and UN conventions. And Schedule 1 says no medical value, which was absolutely... I mean, you know, the 1,000 papers, <laughs> no medical value, because cause we don't want it to be medical value. Uh, they, said, they said they were very dangerous when, <laughs> you know, you've got 40,000 patients have been treated. I mean, you know, as far as we saw, very few harms. In fact, Remarkably, even in, in people who have disorders that we today wouldn't try them in, people with psychosis, they didn't, didn't seem to cause a lot of harm. And they were addictive when, when there were papers published and they were anti-addictive. So this was, this was basically just complete dishonesty. Just, they were trying to, I think, they thought these drugs were so politically challenging, they wanted to eliminate all knowledge of them. And they almost succeeded. In the, in the, 60s, uh, the 70s and 80s, there was almost, you know, there was almost no publications on these drugs, but but then event now, my group and others have started to bring them back because, partly because of the reasons we've got no innovation, and, and partly because the science of them is so fascinating because they do they are a, they do reveal the mind as well and the brain as well as the mind when you do studies on them.